What's up, baby? How you doing? What a rich time in <laughs> song and praise, right? I, I couldn't help but have it impressed upon me as we were, you know, there right now that, uh, you know, how much more you get back as a person when you give out, right? The, 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 the concept or the premise is we come to a church service not necessarily for what we can get from God, but what we bring to God. And I'm not talking about monetarily, but coming with the heart of praise and worship and thanksgiving, like genuinely, right? You know, when you genuinely understand what's been done for you and you're, uh, you're, you're worshiping God and thanking him for all that he's done and you, you just sense that, you get that, you get that deep down in your, in your soul, the understanding of, of the miracle your life is because what yeah. you've been saved from, the fact that you can say that, uh, you know, you know where you're going to go when, when your time comes. You know, that song talked about the grave is overwhelmed. And I believe that that's because every name, every person that's ever been created is going to rise from the dead. And some will be trembling a lot more than others. I think we're all going to have that sense of, uh, of, of that reverent respect and fear of God. But we have security and comfort in the fact that we've been saved. We've accepted him. We've humbly uh, given ourselves over to him. And so for that, we can rejoice. But there's going to be, unfortunately, others that are going to be raised from the dead as well that will resurrect. And it's going to be a not good answer that they're going to get from him. So it is just very interesting to me is, again, we kind of have a tendency, right, as people to, to hoard and hover and hold on. But as you give of yourself, you give yourself to God. The more you give of yourself, the more you give back, the more freedom you have, the more joy you have. And that's a beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, this morning, we are going to wrap up Acts chapter 27. Several verses we're going to be in this morning. Uh, so Acts chapter 27, verses 39 down through 44. This was another portion of scripture where I was like, all right, Lord, <laughs> what is in this text? Because, you know, apart from you, I don't I don't get it. It doesn't seem like there's anything in here. And as uh, you know, time went on, the Lord just began to reveal to me how much is in here. And so uh, it's just. It's crazy when you get to revelation of God and you're like, okay, Lord, how many times do you have to show me that there's so much in your word? I need to just trust you that you're going to speak to my heart and help me to understand your word. So with that, we're in Acts chapter 27. Uh, when you get there, please stand if you can. Verses 39 down through 44. We'll go ahead and pray and then we'll begin <clears throat> getting into our text this morning. Acts chapter 27, 39 down through 44, and it should be on the screen. If you do not have uh, your Bible or a device with the, the Word of God uh, handy. All right. So it says, Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and, let, and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach, but striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the, tur uh, by the surf. Excuse me, verse 42. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that they were all that all were brought safely to land. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, just thank you again for uh, the fact that you're immovable, the fact that you uh, hold all things in your hand, you're, you're, you're in all control. You're full of mercy, full of grace. You withhold your wrath from us. And you give us love and you give us peace and joy instead. Thank you for your 
uh, your forgiving heart. Thank you that your desire is to keep us in your bosom, to have a relationship with us. Would you please speak to us now through your word? Uh, Show us clearly where Jesus is in the text. Show us how uh, this portion of scripture, scripture, excuse me, is applicable to our lives this very day. No matter where we're at, no matter where we find ourselves on the spectrum of life, there's always something to be gained from your word. So may we have ears to listen. May you give us hearts to actually put into motion what we hear this morning. We thank you and love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. You may be seated. I've entitled this message, God over everything. The God of the Bible over everything, Um, over success, over your circumstances, over failures. God is over everything. And if you truly believe that the sovereignty of God, you will agree that God is over everything, that Jesus Christ, the creator of this universe, the creator of this little planet we call Earth, he's in full control. It doesn't matter what is going on around you. It doesn't matter what's going on in the social political realm. It doesn't matter what's going on with the church. It doesn't matter what's going on with the, the world at large. Jesus Christ has full knowledge and full understanding, and he is in control. He is not being bent backwards and bent forward and backwards because of the circumstances of life, but he's merely allowing things to play out as he sees fit, and he uh, he deems himself to step in any circumstance when he feels is necessary. Um, again, this week we're ending chapter 27 of the book of Acts. We actually only have one more chapter, and we will have, Lord willing, completed the book of Acts I think it's a great book to study from, again, showing us what the church is supposed to look like practically, how we can see this played out in our own lives. And and we've been in uh, the last portion of Scripture in Acts 27 where there's just been this rough storm that this crew has been going through. And it's to the point where, you know, the ship is beginning to fall apart and they're on their last leg, if you will. Again, it seems like there's not really going on within this text. It's just like, okay, you know, parts of the ship are breaking off. They're, they're coming up to the turf. They're, 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 they're coming up to the shore. Uh, but there's so much in this portion of Scripture for us to glean from. Uh, so we see daylight has finally broke, and, and the ship is getting closer to dry land. As they come upon the island of Malta, the soldiers had a plan. And I laughed when I when I first read this. I'm like, wow, this is their plan. <laughs> this is their plan moving forward. This is what they think is the wise thing to do. You see, but the plan that they had, it wasn't to, to edify others, and it wasn't meant to glorify God. They were desperate, and they were trying to save their own behinds yet again. But gr- thankfully, God is faithful And he helps us through despite our poor planning and our poor choices, um, as we'll see in our text this morning. There are several main points that I want us to focus in on. And and this, again, is where uh, the the beauty and the majesty of God comes through, because at least for me, when I looked at this text, I didn't see where any of these things were at first glance. And then obviously the Lord had to reveal this to me. And it's like, wow, that's beautiful. That's that's amazing that these are, are are. are, are, are such, such, so, much, so many principles are found just in this small portion of text where it just seems like it's fine details. But the first main point is this. Man may throw the dice, but the Lord determines where they land. Now, if you don't know that, that's a proverb from chapter 16, verse 33. That's a, that's a beautiful verse. Man may throw the dice, but God determines where those dice land, where they fall. And, and, and paraphrasing, if I may, it's basically saying we can create our own plans. We make our own plans all the time. But God determines the course of those plans and how those plans play out. Right? Many times we make all kind of plans. I'm going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. That's where this whole idea of Lord willing comes into play. Many people don't yeah. say that any, any, anymore nowadays. They don't say Lord willing. They say, oh, we're going to go do this and do that next week. But they forget, Lord willing, I'm not guaranteed the rest of this service, you know. Heaven forbid, but I could drop dead. You could, someone could drop dead in this building. And and that's not doom and gloom. That's understanding the brevity of life, taking every moment, every ounce of breath you take in as a blessing, as a miracle. That's not over crazy. That's, That's just sensitive to the spirit of God. That's sensitive to the gift of life that you possess 
the oxygen in your lungs, the blood pulsing through your veins, your heart beating at the rate it's beating. Do you, do you understand there are some people that did not wake up this morning? They did not crawl out of bed, right? You, you might have back pain. You might have leg pain. You might have had a migraine. Thank God that you had those things and you could move about because there's many people in this world that did not make it to another day. This whole idea of man making their own plans, but God determining the course of those plans. This is what we see in our text this morning. You see, the crew came up with this plan to kill every prisoner that was aboard that ship. They said, we're going to kill him. <laughs> we're going to kill him to ensure everyone is accounted for. No one leaves. They are going to die <laughs> by the bow or by the sword. Because we are not going to uh, endanger our, our brevity, our life for them. The only problem with this plan was everything, everything was wrong with this plan. Again, they were steeped in this idea of saving their own selves. They were looking out for their own interests. They figured if they had killed all the prisoners themselves... This would ensure that their lives would be spared when Caesar would eventually find out what had happened. Even though they devised this diabolical plan, the Lord determined that it would not manifest itself. It would not come to pass. It would not come to be. The Lord had closed the door on this idea or this concept of them carrying out this heinous act of killing all these prisoners to ensure that they their own safety. You see, many times we create our own plans, but yet again, God has the final word on what amen. goes on. And, and, and amen. And then this is why we as believers in Christ need to be encouraged by the word of God and what we find in the scripture and not be moved or shaken by the things going on in this world. Yes, there should be concern. We should be prayerfully, uh, again, praying for people that need it. Uh, again, there's a lot going on. But we shouldn't be shaken to the core because God has the final word. And if we understand the course of life and if we understand how Scripture reveals things, we should not be taken back by uh, the acts that we see going on in the world. This is all part of the process. If you will, these things that we are experiencing now may even be very well some of these birth pains that begin right and it's not to be doom and gloom but things are going to get worse before they ultimately get better because this is the course the world has to take in order for the lord jesus to come back right praise god that you're part of that uh, millennial millennial reign those who are saved will reign with christ for a thousand years before we're finally enter into eternity and there's a lot to be done. There's a lot going to go on in the world before that happens. And so we see, we see it happening in our world. But again, take heart that God has the final word on every circumstance. And we have to understand as well, things have to pass through the Lord's hands before they come into your life, right? Look at Joseph. You know, we want to talk about we have it hard. Look at Joseph's life. <laughs> you're, you're sold into slavery by all your brothers. All your siblings say we can't stand you. Your, your daddy's best, and we don't like your fancy coat, so we're, 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 we're throwing you uh, into a pit. We're going we're gonna to sell you to, uh, to Egyptian traders, and you're going to go live over there. He was in prison for 12 years for a wrongful accusal of rape. <laughs> you know, that's, can you imagine that? Being in prison for 12 years, you didn't do it. You, <laughs> you weren't wrong. You did nothing wrong. You see, but what did Joseph say to his brothers when they did eventually bow down before him like the dream? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, God will allow difficult and even hard, bad circumstances to enter into our lives. But it's for our own good. It's for our edification. It's for us to understand that God is sovereign and he is good no matter what circumstances come into our lives. And so when we look at the landscape of our culture, we look at the landscape of the world. There's good that's going to come out of this dark situation that it seems like a lot of humanity is in. And you have a pivotal role to play in that as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. Wow, 
You have the great responsibility and you have the power harnessed within you, within your soul, with the power of the Holy Spirit to administer grace, mercy, and truth to those around you. That's a beautiful thing. That's amazing. That's a beautiful thing to consider. Okay, the second main point is this. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are forgetful like sheep and need constant reminders from the Lord. Again, using this crew as a focal point, as Jesus explains to us why this is true, why we are like wayward sheep. Okay, we remember the text the last several weeks. This, this crew had just been given a second chance, right? They were facing certain death and they were helpless. They were hopeless. 14 days, two weeks, no sunlight, no nightlight, no, no warm bed to sleep in. It was nasty, cold, scurvy going on. No eating, throw up everywhere. It was devastating. It was a devastating situation they were in. Then they received encouragement from Paul that no one would die, right? They tried to uh, escape the ship, <laughs> leaving all the prisoners to die, right? They said, well, we're just going to leave. We're, we're going to bounce. We're going to swim away, and we'll, we'll let all these prisoners just stay on the ship and, and, and be by themselves. Next, they cried out to the Lord. They don't even know God, but they did their best crying out to whoever God is, please bring daylight. He brings daylight. Now they're about to land on this island. They're coming up to this island. And then they devise a plan to kill every single prisoner. Do, do, do you see the flow of what's going on? They're, they're desperate. They cry out to God. He answers. <laughs> then, they, then they divert. They forget that they just have been blessed with a miracle and they divert back to their old ways. And again, they do the same thing over and over again. Question is this, how do we respond? Do we respond the same way? Do we ask God, do we beg God for, for, a, 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 for a prayer to be answered? And the moment it's answered, you know, we, we're, we're praising Him for a minute and then we go right back to doing the same old thing like a wayward sheep, forgetful, forgetting what has been done. Forgetting the gratefulness, forgetting what it cost God the Father to give his own son to die in our place. And yet we trample upon the blood of Christ as if, as if it's common. It should not be that way. It should not be that way. You see, the Lord answers a desperate prayer for us, but we need to remember and not be wayward. We see in Isaiah chapter 56, uh, 53, excuse me, verse 6, it tells us all we, like sheep, have gone astray, all of us, right? We have all turned every single one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. So we see clearly, uh, even if we say, well, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't forget. I was just talking to Michelle early. God bless you, Lou. Um, you know, it's like I heard a message this morning, and, and the pastor was talking about you could be the most spiritual person in the world. You could have every single encouraging verse memorized. It's good to have scripture memorized, but you know what? This is a one another ministry in the body of Christ. And there are going to be times where all the scripture in the world, I'm not saying it isn't going to help you. What I'm saying is there's going to be moments and seasons of your life where you're going to need a tangible person to come alongside you and to say, be encouraged, brother, be encouraged, sister, you're going to get through this. And I'm not saying preach to you, but someone who will just let you cry it out and be there for you. Right. And, 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 and this is this is what it means by, you know, the Lord giving himself to us. We needed that. We needed that tangible person, 100 percent man, 100 percent God to come down from heaven to die upon that cross to resurrect so that we may be forgiven and we may have the peace and the joy that he gives to us. Right. Because the, the, the bulls and the lambs, it wasn't cutting it. <laughs> it wasn't cutting it. It was not going to suffice for an eternity of peace and to be a, a, a part of from the Lord's wrath. And so he did this. And so we must understand that as well, that this is something that we need to take hold of for our own selves, for the benefit of not only ourselves, but those around us. All right, the third main point is this. God will many times use the most unlikely people to carry out his plans. The Bible is clear that he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. The foolish things. He's in the business of restoration. He uses people that are unlikely characters. The people that the world looks at as, who are you? You're nobody. 
That's exactly who God wants to use. The people who are not esteemed by society, the people that do not have a great uh, deal of influence. He can use people like that as well. But if, if you look all throughout the Bible, oh, man, this should be an encouragement to me and you, because you may come through these doors this morning and say, who am I? Who am I? I'm just I'm just a mere old person. I don't I don't have any significance. I don't have a great ministry where I'm seeing loads and droves of people coming to Christ. I'm not part of a, a big church where we're just seeing oh, many people being baptized all the time, this and that. But it's not about that. It's not about those things. That's that's, if you will, window dressing. Because it, the Lord wants to use you specifically where you're at. Will you allow him to do that? Will you allow him to? to have full reign and control in your life and in your heart to be able to be used in a mighty way for his glory. You see, this centurion probably had no idea of how big a role he was playing. It was a pivotal role he was playing in God's plan for Paul's ministry to continue on to Rome. Remember, the Lord told Paul, you will make it before Caesar. But this centurion had a major role in that. You see, this centurion was used to persuade this crew of sailors who wanted to murder every single last prisoner. He persuaded them to ditch the idea instead to ensure that everyone would make it to the island safely. Again, when you look throughout all the pages of scripture, that's all who God used was misfits and those who you would never expect for the Lord to use. One main reason why he does this, we may ask, why does he do this? Why does God use people who are insignificant, who seem like they don't even have a place? Why would you use someone like that? Why would you use these people? Well, he does it to show that he's behind the miracle. He's behind the work, not man, not man at all. Look at, look at the example of, of David as a boy, as a young shepherd boy, right? David and Goliath, was it the smooth stone that he picked up that had the power to, to kill Goliath, a giant, a man that could eat these Israelites alive? No, oh, it was, it was the, the commanding authority that was placed upon David's life. And, and, and the Lord used David as a young boy in that mighty way to prove to all of these wayward people that the God of Israel is all-powerful and in full control of every situation. And David was humble enough and had enough wisdom to understand, I need to give the Lord all the praise, honor, and glory for this act. And he did so. And as he did so, he rose in authority and, 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 and power to be a servant of the Lord in that way. You see, the Lord is the only one capable to do such things, and he is the only one deserving of all honor, all praise, and all glory. And when we get that right and we get that correct in our own lives, you can celebrate the victories you have with so much more confidence and security because you know where your victory comes from. You know it's not by your hands, but it is by God's will as he works through you. That's a beautiful thing. That's, a, that's amazing to, to see the power of God manifest itself in your life and in the lives of those around you by how you humble yourself before God and you see him work. So we're going to see how all these main points, these three main points play out in our text this morning. Okay, let's go ahead and break these verses down. So I'm going to go ahead and read from verse 39 down through 41. And it says, now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with the beach on which they planned if possible to run the ship ashore so they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea at the same time loosening the ropes that tied to the rudders they hoisted the foresail to the wind they made for the beach but striking a reef they ran the vessel aground the bow stuck and remained immovable and the stern was being broken up by the surf so the first thing that we see right here is they didn't recognize that there was land that they were coming up upon. They, we, last week we had talked about uh, the, the, the measurements that they used to, to see how close they were getting to, uh, to the land. But they didn't realize at this point that they were coming very close to the land, that they were going to break upon the rocks, if you will. The place where they came, it's, it's known as St. Paul's Bay. This is significant because 
Again, this is another answered prayer. This was a miracle that the ship and the passengers had made it to this island. Because if they had missed Malta, the island that they landed upon, they would have had to travel at least 200 more miles before they hit the Tuscan coast. And they probably wouldn't have survived. It was, again, a very treacherous storm. And so all things had to play out in their favor, and they did. If you think about it, you you think of your life and you think about all the way different circumstances have to fall into place in order for certain things to happen. And you wonder, man, how did this happen? It's because the Lord allowed it. The application is this. When you have any situation in your life that you can't explain, you can't explain it, how you made it through. (laughs) consider that a miracle. That's a great miracle. (laughs) You don't know how you made it through, but you're still here, right? We've all been there in some sort of way. I mean, think about it. The odds were stacked against you in some kind of way. Maybe it was the doctors told you you weren't going to make it. You only have X amount of time to live and that is it. They're going to pull the cord. You're done. They're already writing your obituary. They're writing you off. Maybe it was all the financial numbers. You look, at, uh, you look at your bills. You look at what's going on. And you're like, there's no way I'm going to make it, Lord. I, th- th- it just doesn't add up. How am I going to make it through? They're going to take away what I have. Everything I've worked so hard for, I'm going to lose it. Maybe it's your disposition in society. Maybe it's not in your favor. And you feel like everything around you and everyone around you is just poking and prodding at you and pointing out your faults and showing you how you're not worthy and how you shouldn't make it and you're not going to make it, how you're a loss and a loser. But woe and behold, what happens? A miracle. A miracle. Amen. Suddenly, your health takes a turn for the better and you recover, right? Somehow you receive some form of financial blessing, or, or monetary blessing or physical blessing with goods that gets you through your storm or your circumstance. Or maybe it's despite your status in society that you beat the odds and what you were predisposed to be, you're not that at all. You're totally the opposite of what, what they say. That's what you're supposed to be because that's where you come from. That's your background or that's, your, that's the class that you're in or that's the race or the culture that you're in. So that's what you're going to become. And, and you become something totally different. These are all examples of daily miracles that the Lord provides. And this crew, speaking of our context, they just received this miracle. They, they didn't know how they were going to make it. Remember, they prayed for daylight, 14 days, nothing, no daylight, no nightlight. <laughs> and, and, and finally, they find their, themselves coming upon this island. This was a miracle. Mark chapter 10, verse 27 tells us, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. This is a beautiful thing. But we, again, we have to understand the context. You see, because sometimes people will say, oh, I I can do anything through Christ. Yes, anything that's going to honor him. Anything that's going to honor him. But just because you want to win the lottery, just because you want to have, you know, a a, a wife that has a figure five and and, and a husband that that, that has, you know, that's shredded, (laughs) that that may not be something that's going to honor God. Many, Many times, maybe the Lord is like, you know what? If, if I give you uh, the spouse that you think you want like that, you know what? You're going to end up worshiping them and not worshiping me. So let me give you somebody who's actually going to be better for your character and who you are. Because, right, it's all about what's on the inside of a person that really matters, their character, how they are. Because we're all going to get saggy and gray and old. And that's just, that's just life. You know, I don't care how much Botox you put in. I don't, I don't care how many hours you put in the gym, you know. You, if you could be like the, the male Ken doll, that the stuff, I mean, still going to be, it's still all going to, you know, fall apart. So, you know, th- these are things we have to understand. As long as it's in the right context, the context of God's word, nothing is impossible for God as long as we honor him. You see, the next thing we look at is it's just speaking of the specs of the ship and what was going on. It says the, the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern, excuse me, the stern was being broken up. By the violence of the waves. Okay, so 
it, it's basically falling apart at this point. The ship's not going to make it. It's on its last leg, and, and, and they had to get to shore. Um, it was pounding this vessel so much that it was just going to break apart, and everyone on board was going to have to jump ship. So that's where we are in our context this morning in our text. Now, next, when we see the last few verses, and this is where we're going to spend the remainder of our morning, because this is really the heart of it in these last two verses, 42 and through 44. And it says, the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Amen. That's a beautiful thing. He said, (laughs) so it was. They all made it despite this craziness that we see right here. The text says the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest anybody escape and swim away. To these soldiers, though, Right. It made sense for them to kill these prisoners because uh, according to the Roman military law, those who were guarding prisoners, if the prisoners escaped, the guards would suffer the same fate as the prisoner. And so for many of these prisoners, all of them pretty much, they were all sentenced to die. And so that means that all of these guards would have died. Their lives would have been taken had not they kept these prisoners alive and safe and right where they needed to be in Rome in one piece. So from the world's perspective, again, look at the world, look at society. What they were doing was the right thing. They were doing the right thing. I mean, why should they die, right? Why should they die? They didn't commit any crimes. It's these prisoners' faults. They're the ones who messed up. They're the ones who are in custody. They're the ones who broke the law. I, if I was a guard, I didn't break any law. So in my mind, you know, there are, you're already on your way to die in the Colosseum. You're on your way to Rome. You're going to die. What's the difference of you dying here on this island <laughs> if we don't make it to Rome? You're going to die anyway. So why don't I just make it a little easier and let me take your life from you so you don't have to deal with a lion ripping you apart in a Colosseum. You see, but this is typically how we respond to a situation when we're simply viewing it through the flesh. They were not viewing it through a a, a spiritual lens or a spiritual lens that was evoked by the Holy Spirit. Yes, they were viewing it through a spiritual lens, if you will, but it was a spiritual lens of darkness. It was an unclean spirit that was motivating and moving these people. That's what we mean by in the flesh, right? Because when we're in our flesh, we're not We're not moved by the Holy Spirit. We're moved by the carnality of our lives and what we see physically. You see, they created their own plan without consulting the Lord about the matter. I have an example. It's a silly example, but I'll share it anyways. So, you know, I've been, like anybody else, I've been itching about this whole, you know, COVID and uh, this whole, you know, man, it's only a year and a half, lockdown, masks, and, uh, you know, our anniversary is coming up, uh, you know, next week. It'll be eight years, and I'm like, every year we plan, and, you know, we go somewhere. I want to go stay at the Portola Inn, the spa. I like that place. I just like to, I like, just like to lay out and go somewhere. My wife's like, why do you want to go somewhere and pay all this money and it's a pandemic when you don't even check in till four. They kick you out at 12 the next day. You're not even there 24 hours. I said, you know what? That's what we go for. That's what we go for several days. So now I don't got to rush. And I'm trying to take in consideration. We got little children. So, you know, they don't make it through a whole day. So if we go stay somewhere, we can do something, go to the aquarium and then go back to the room and lounge out for a little bit and then go back out. And the Lord had to show me. Man. <laughs> you're making these plans. You want these plans. I almost felt like Lot's wife because I'm, I'm I, I, in, a, in a sense, I was longing for the past because I enjoy, you know, going to the, the double tree at the marina and, you know, renting a suite and having all that space and just being able to just do whatever you want and just be lazy and jump on the bed. And I don't got to clean up. You know, I can go to the Japanese restaurant and watch them chop up and throw shrimp in my mouth and, you know, do all that. And my wife's like, Keith, 
We usually book ahead. And it's a pandemic. But it's like 300 something dollars a night. Can you justify that? I'm like, God, we, we got money. We haven't spent our money in a year and a half on stuff like that. Yeah, we can just blow it. It's all good. And the Lord had to show me again. Like, you know, are, 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 you, are you filtering these plans down through me? Or are you just doing what you want to do? And it's just kind of just like that sweater. And by the way, I never got that sweater. I never got that sweater. I guess I don't have a desire for it anymore. Maybe when the weather changes, I'll probably have a desire for that sweater again. But I, And it's still on sale, so I can get it 40% off. But in any event, I know it's a super silly example. But I mean, again, this just goes to show you and I. We need to consider the Lord in every single thing we do. Amen. When we fail to do that, we are not living as we should. Sometimes we can say, oh, well, and I'm, and I'm not being, I'm not being facetious. So, I mean, whatever. If you want a certain bag of Skittles, I'm not saying you got to pray about it. But when there are certain things, because we have free will, you know, that's like the, that's like, again, I'll use the marriage analogy. If the person is an honest believer in Christ or wherever you're at, it's like chocolate chip cookie, oatmeal raisin cookie, sugar cookie, snickerdoodle. They're all cookies. The Lord's not going to be like, it doesn't, you know, yeah, you have to have the snickerdoodle. No, you have the free will to choose. But I'm talking about when it comes down to you're really trying to put something in motion. Do you and I bring these plans before the Lord and ask him, Lord, direct my path. Give me wisdom on what I'm supposed to do. Or do we just say, you know what? I have this idea in my mind and I'm going forth with it because I want to fulfill the desires of my own heart. We know what the Bible says about our hearts. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked. And we're only deceiving ourselves <laughs> if we allow ourselves to believe that our hearts aren't. And we're like, no, I don't need to consider you, Lord, in this. No, that's not right. So, again, as silly as that example was, there's truth in it. Just like these men in this story. Again, with them wanting to kill all of these men to eradicate them like roaches so they could save their own behinds, they were trying to apply human wisdom to a spiritual problem. But in this case, it wasn't even human wisdom. It was more like human wrath or human anger. It reminds me of James chapter 1, verse 20. I go through this all the time with my son as I discipline him. The Lord constantly has to remind me, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Right? Our wrath does not produce God's righteousness. I'm not saying that we shouldn't discipline our children. You very well need to discipline your children. But it has to be done in a manner, again, led by the Holy Spirit and not led by your physical hand. <laughs> because that's not good. That's not a good thing. Okay. Sure. Again, in regards to these, these guards killing the prisoners, they, they could have killed them, right? And, and maybe for the moment, they would have been in the clear. They would have felt like they were justified. We did the right thing. They were prisoners of Rome and they got killed. We did our job. But was it God's desire for all these prisoners to die? You see, remember, the Lord revealed to Paul that Paul would not die and he would make it to Rome. But the Lord also showed him that none of the passengers would die either. So why would the Lord allow these people to remain alive? Why? Why would the Lord allow these prisoners, these heinous people, these people that committed sinful acts, why would the Lord allow them to live? I believe it's found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, this was the Lord's desire for these prisoners. That, 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 that somehow a little crack in the door would open and the Lord would have the opportunity to minister to these men through Paul and that they would receive salvation, mercy, and grace through Jesus Christ. You see, Paul understood this. He saw that there were things that God was doing all along the way in different people's lives as he was getting Paul before Caesar. You see, 
It's so interesting because these men, again, they just received a huge miracle from God. Speaking of the guards, not only did the Lord save them from this disastrous storm, but he kept every single person aboard that ship alive. And right after the Lord delivered everyone from the ship to dry land, or while this was happening, excuse me, the crew decided again that they were going to kill <laughs> every person. How quickly they forgot what they had just been given. A great blessing, and they forgot already. Again, this is an example of how important it is for us as humans to understand our waywardness and to look to the Lord instead of our own selves. Again, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it shows us this. This is a great reminder. It shows us that, again, like sheep, we have all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, speaking of Jesus Christ, the iniquity of all of us. You see that because we have turned our own way, for you to sit here this morning and say, you profess Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, that's a miracle. Because you, like I, had turned our own way. We've gone our own way. We, we went astray. But the Lord said, no, no, no. I'm going to chasten you. My one sheep, the 99 are saved and you're the one. And I'm going to go. I'm going to come. I'm going to pursue you. Right? Pursue you. It doesn't matter what time you came to the Lord. If you came to the Lord in your 50s, your 40s, your 20s, maybe you were 14. Up until that point, the Lord was pursuing you. Chasing you. Waiting for you to open up the door of your heart so that he could come in and dine with you and call you friend, call you son, call you daughter. Now you're a child of the Most High. But these things have happened to us, and it's a miracle that we can sit here and say of ourselves, I serve the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Amen? You see, it's not just the crew and the sailors that are forgetful. Again, all of humanity, because of sin, has turned their back on God. This is exactly why Jesus Christ had to reconcile us back to himself. It seems super silly, right? Again, they had just been delivered and saved. But in the very next breath, they wanted to kill all these soldiers. The Bible is clear that we are not to forget what has been done for us. But many times we do. This is why we are encouraged with verses like this found in James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. I love these verses. I mean, it paints just the beautiful illustration of what the Lord's talking about. Don't forget. Well, what is James pen? He says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Isn't that amazing that we are capable of doing that? <laughs> we, can, we can sit under, uh, under Bible teaching, whether it's here, whether it's in a podcast, whether it's listening to a worship song, and we're like, oh, we're all about it. <laughs> and a moment later, oh, a, a great example, right? <laughs> in your car, listening to some worship song, oh, K-Love's on, or you're listening to, you know, whatever, Vernon McGee on K-Fax, you're all into the message. All of a sudden, someone cuts you off and you give them the finger. <laughs> what? I thought you were all about what the pastor was saying, what the Lord was saying to him. Give him some grace. Give, yeah, they were driving like a bum, but give him some grace. It's not going to kill you to just keep your hand down. Don't be cursing at the person. Don't act up. My wife's always like, man, I don't need to hear your commentary when we drive. I can't help it. That's just how it is. I'm like, man, this person don't know how to drive. I don't know what they're doing. And She's like, just, just stop. Just stop. And sometimes the Lord is like that to just stop. Remember, why, why are you so quick to forget? You know, we don't want to admit it, but we're like those sheep. We're like those sheep. And we know sheep are not that smart. That's why they need a shepherd. That's why the shepherd needs that crook to snatch them up because they want to go. They, they're, they're not aware. And we're the same way. But it, 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 we should be growing in the sense of little by little, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, we should be able to look back and say, I have victory in these areas. I don't struggle as much with all these things because my salvation is being worked out with fear and trembling. Not that we, our works save us, but the Bible is clear. You and I must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. If we don't take that seriously, that's that whole, I got my get out of hell pass and that's it. No, that's not how it works. 
You're being sanctified every second of your life in Jesus Christ. That means there's a working going on in the inner man, the inner woman, and there should be manifested healthy spiritual fruit that we see that we can say, yes, these are the stripes that prove that I'm a child of God. And it's not just my hand being raised in a service because that doesn't save you. We talked about this last week. It's you alone with the Lord. Nobody can tell you that experience didn't happen. And when you gave over your life, when you said, Lord, that's it, you are king, you reign. It's at that moment, that, that millisecond, that instance, that that miracle occurs and your soul saved and you begin that process of sanctification. But there should be markers and we don't want to be like that person that goes in the bathroom and gets all dolled up and looks all fancy and then we turn around and we forget what we're doing, right? We want to be those that remember, remember. And that's where, again, conviction plays a pivotal role because when we do forget, the Holy Spirit will convict and bring us back in the right standing as long as we pay attention to that conviction and don't say, oh, wish it away. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. No, hear it. Hear it. Hear it, because it's for your good. It's for my good. So we can be right with the Lord. Then you can be a clean vessel for his usage. And you don't have to feel the guilt. You don't have to feel the shame. You know, don't you love the fact that your salvation is not based on your performance? None of, none, of the, none of what I do up here has any bearing on my salvation, because it's not about this. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ before I'm a pastor. Pastoring is something that I do tangibly. It doesn't identify me. My identification is in Jesus Christ alone. I don't care about this pulpit. I don't care about standing up here. It's not about that, right? When we get that right, you have freedom to do what the Lord calls you to do. I don't have to slave and figure out what I'm going to say. It's the Holy Spirit that takes, takes control. But that only happens when we have the right perspective of who Jesus is and who we are. You see, it's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm beginning to experience this more and more in my life, and it's so liberating and free. I don't, I don't feel afraid. I don't feel shame. I don't feel nervous. This is just, this is what, this is supernatural, how the Lord moves and speaks and shares, and, 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 and I, I enjoy uh, allowed to be a part of uh, this journey with the Lord. And in your life as well, you will notice the liberty and the freedom that you have to do the things that the Lord has gave you a passion for doing when you understand it's the Lord that is doing it through you. It's like, man, that's so cool, Lord. I, I, I'm like, I don't have to trip on it. I don't have to be so worried. I don't have to worry at all. I just pray about it. Like Philippians 4, worry about nothing, pray about everything. Tell the Lord what you need and thank him for all he has done. That's all you got to do. It's so, that's just amazing. It's a beautiful thing. I get so pumped up about that. You see, Jesus taught a lot about foolishness and forgetfulness of going astray. If you want to look at theological terms, this, this idea of we, we like sheep have all gone astray, it's what some call original sin, right? Isaiah explained to us that, that all of us have become like one who was unclean and, and, and our righteous deeds are, are like a filthy garment. That none are exempt from this universal curse of guilt. That means everyone who's born into this world is already naturally born in this disposition. It doesn't matter. We're all born into sin. That no one is righteous, no, not one. That there is no one who does good, not even one. This is apart from God. None of us seek him. <clears throat> none of us seek to do good. Even the good that we think we're doing, there's, there's some kind of shade added to it. Even if you're nice and cute like the, the Girl Scouts of America and, 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 and you're, you're trying to hustle Samoas to people, you know. There's, a, there's some ulterior motive in there. It's not just as pure and packaged as the little cookies seem to be because it's all about the coin. <laughs> all are guilty and all are without excuse. This is before Christ. We have no merit to stand on our own before a holy God because inevitably in the depths of who we are, we're guilty before him. We're without excuse because we've gone our own way. But this is where the story changes and the beauty is beholded. It's because of his love for this world, his love for his creation. What's up, beautiful children? <laughs> it's because of his love for this world that while we were still dead in sin, doing our own thing, going our own way, 
What's up with this girl with her shirt off? Man, what's going on? Is that a diaper? <laughs> While we were still sinners, Christ died in our place. He took that penalty. He took that shame. He took that guilt upon himself to pay the penalty, to endure the judgment that we were supposed to take so that we wouldn't have to. He paid the debt that we couldn't even begin to pay. And now because of that, we can freely receive the gift of grace through faith by trusting in him. That's all we have to do is trust in him. Believe there's a God of all creation and he is him and I am not him. And I just hold out my hands open wide. Lord, please give me your gift. Please save my soul. Please give me that peace that passes all understanding. May I be secure in you. May I find my identity and my hope in you. That's a beautiful thing. We, we literally can receive that. That's what being born again is called. It's, it, yes, we are commanded and called to be baptized where there's water, but the water baptism doesn't save you. It's not about that. It's about what has happened to your heart. How is your soul being transformed? Because you can, I've been, I've been baptized two times. You know, I was younger, went to one church. I'm like, we're going to baptize you. I'm like, I don't even know what y'all are talking about. Baptize me. This is where my older brothers, you know, Church of Christ, and I'm not even going to get into all that. But when they baptized me. Then I went to an apostolic church in my mid-20s. They baptized me then. I've already been baptized. And they also told me you can't have no facial hair, just a mustache. What? Okay. What? You know, all the legalistic stuff. I don't care. You want facial hair, you don't want facial hair. That's not what Jesus is tripping on. But you see, water baptism, it doesn't, it doesn't save you. And we already know about the Catholic Church. They do the whole little drip, drip. When the baby, does that mean that they're saved? We're not going to get into that. It's a heart condition. Yes, like the Ethiopian eunuch. I don't mean to be going on and on about this, but I'm trying to make it crystal clear. There was water. He said, pull the buggy over. May I be baptized, right? But but it's just symbolism. It's like the wedding ring. It's really what's going on internally within you. And again, there should be markings that you've been saved and changed in Christ. Once this happens and we're born again, we're made alive in Christ spiritually. Before we were spiritually dead, darkened by the things of this world. We, we had no spiritual antenna for anything good. All we saw was the flesh and the physical. But now we are made new creations in Christ, new creatures in Christ. And as new creatures in Christ, new creations, we can carry out the works he has prepared for us. And these are the things that you and I are called to do. Like when you have a heart and, you know, I see Gene Scott and we're, you know, we're, we are going to start. We'll talk about this next week as a, a announcement. I didn't tell her already, but I'm sure my wife did. You know, they want to start um, gathering the, the, the items for Operation Christmas Child a little earlier. Right. Um, but, you know, I'm saying her passion for doing what she does as one of the things she does. Right. That's a good work that the Lord's prepared for her. And she's supposed to walk in that. Right. Others of you that have other passions and and, and things that the Lord has placed upon your heart that you have a strong desire to do. But now that you're a new creation in Christ, you can walk in that and you can do that in love and in genuine sincerity. But this is what happens when we are saved while we are like sheep and we have gone astray. The reality and the beautiful thing is this. We don't have to continue walking on that path in deadness and in sin and in shame. All we have to do is choose to turn to Christ. And that's that free will decision. That's that free will choice that all of us have in Christ. Lastly, we see here that the centurion wanted to save Paul. He kept them from their purpose of trying to kill every prisoner. You see, God gave Paul favor in the eyes of this Roman centurion. And that favor kept Paul and all of these prisoners alive. It was a fulfillment of the word that was spoken to Paul from the Lord. It said, he said, the Lord did, that God granted to all of them who sailed with Paul that they were going to live and they weren't going to die. And the reality is this, God's word never fails. It never fails. We have to trust and bank on the promises of God. You see, of all the people that the Lord could have used in this circumstance, he used the centurion. Out of all these people. And this Roman centurion, actually, he stood to lose the most. Because he was the one who was responsible for the well-being of these prisoners getting from Caesarea down to Rome. He would have been the first one to lose his life 
for letting any of these prisoners escape. And yet, he had said no to the plan to have this crew killed. The Bible is full of stories of God using people who are failures, who are unworthy, who look like they're the most unlikely characters, but the Lord chooses to use them like he used this centurion here. I'll give us four real quick as we begin to wind down this message. The first is Abraham. (laughs) We know good old Abe, right? We know good old Abe. And this would be the man later known as the father of the nation of Israel. Abraham's life was far from perfect. Far from perfect, right? We often highlight Abraham's faith that God gave him that, uh, you know, he didn't kill Isaac, Right. He 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 withheld the knife and he didn't take his life. But we all know he was not alone in this. Sarah, <laughs> she didn't believe the promise. She's like, go stay with Hagar because I can't bear any children. I'm too old. And we know from that Ishmael was born. And that's how you get the whole Muslim nation. If you trace all that back, that's where all the Muslims come from. They come from that line. You know, God's heart is still. He wants those Muslims converted and saved, too. But the reality is that's where that line comes from. It comes from disobedience. He was diso- They were both disobedient. And they didn't get the blessing. And that's why there's all this confrontation in the Middle East to this day. And the Gaza Strip and all this fighting over old Jerusalem and all that because of that disobedience. Despite this, God stayed faithful and gave Abraham and Sarah Isaac. And this is how the nation of Israel was born. That's a beautiful thing. Man, this man was disobedient in a super, super... That's, you don't go do that. You don't go lay with the, with the, with the, with the, with the maid servant. <laughs> you know? That's not right. That's crazy. He did that. The Lord still blessed him. That doesn't give us a license to sin, but we see the sovereignty of God despite man's waywardness. Next one. We all know good old Samson. Oh, man. Sammy boy. What was going on with this man? Of all the men in the Old Testament, there was probably no one more hard-headed and arrogant than Samson. Because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, he thought he could do whatever he wanted. You know, he killed the, he killed the lion. What happened? The Lord said, don't eat anything dead. Honey, all that. He's doing it. He said, don't go buy grapes. He's going by all the grapes. He's doing all this stuff. Don't cut your hair. Don't mess with those people. Don't go with that woman. Because he was seduced so strongly by the lust of his heart for the beauty of this woman, he just defiled himself to the point where he became a shell of a man. But ultimately, God would bring his purposes to pass through Samson. Even when he was blinded, he get, his hair grew back, right? <laughs> He had strength one more time. Ah! Ah, pulling the pillars and everything came down on him. You know, that's a beautiful, uh, that's a beautiful uh, uh, understanding of as long as you've got your heart beating and breath in your lungs, you're never out of the game. You're never out. The Lord can still use you. Don't believe the lie from the enemy that you're washed up and done. You're washed up and done if you decide you're washed up and done. But you can be like Samson and say, Lord, use me again. Clean, created me a clean heart. Renew me a right spirit. Make me right before you. Help me to submit to your will and I will do what you say. You just got to mean it. Don't pray a prayer like that and go right back out, creeping out the back door, doing your own thing because you're going to get smitten and you're gonna, it's going to be all bad. But if you truly mean it, the Lord will have grace and mercy upon your life and he will still use you. Moses, we got two more and I'll end. <laughs> Good old Mo. Oh, man, he was the prince of Egypt. He was a prince of Egypt. But he was also a coward and a murderer at one time. A murderer! You hear me? Yeah, a murderer. He took someone's life. He did not have the authority to do it, and he took someone's life. After having killed the Egyptian, he fled to Midian, only to be called there by God in the form of a burning bush. He was there for 40 years. 40 years. You know, Joseph in prison for 12. Thought Joseph had it hard. Moses was out there for 40 years. Man. And the, you know, the backside of the desert. That's where he had to get trained up. Right? 
He also had speech issues. Lord, I can't talk to them. I, I, I can't talk to them. What did the Lord do? We'll use Aaron. You want to be all insecure? I'll use Aaron. It's all good. <laughs> He'll be your right hand man, you know. Um, but the Lord still used Moses in a mighty way. A murderer, someone who uh, was a coward, who didn't uh, have a speech impediment. No, the Lord still used him. The Lord still used him in a mighty way. Despite all of his insufficiency, God was faithful. And I'll end with Peter. Good old Peter. What did the Lord say about Peter? Upon your proclamation of what you, who you said I am, I will build my church upon the rock of what you said. The, the fact that you said that I am the Christ. But, you know, Peter wasn't always that bold in the sense of he was impulsive, but he wasn't always that bold. We know that he denied Jesus many times, right? And later had to be restored back to the Lord after he was asked several times, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> Peter, do you love me? These weren't rhetorical uh, questions that were asked, but, but Jesus was trying to make a point to Peter understanding where Peter's heart truly was. And even though Peter had denied the Lord like that, we know the difference between Peter and uh, our boy who's not good. He ended up hanging himself. He ended up hanging himself and Peter repented. So we know the difference between Judas and Peter. You see, the Lord's desire is to use the foolish things of this world, again, to confound the wise, the most unlikely characters. Today, you are the most unlikely character, and the Lord wants to use you. May we be those who humble ourselves before God to be counted as fools to this world, but be given the wisdom of God to be used for His greatness and His glory. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for just your word and, and how there's so much in it for us every time we crack open the Bible. Lord, we thank you that your word is living and active and that your word never returns void. It always accomplishes its purpose no matter how it's shared. It never returns void. So we pray now, Lord, that you would work within our hearts. May you do what only you can do and transform a person's heart or do that work so that we may be those counted to live out our lives for you, that we may be holy vessels set apart for your sake. Father, we thank you and we love you. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.